Hello, welcome to our weekly devotions. I'm Pastor David Schub. We're here at Trinity Lutheran Church in West Bend, and we begin our devotions today with a reading from the book of Romans, the 12th chapter. I appeal to you, therefore, siblings, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we are many. And we are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. Now, most biblical scholars would remind me that these words were spoken by Paul to those who were together in the Christian community. There wasn't a wider application that Paul was pointing to. And that this was primarily how they were supposed to live as Christians together. And scholars are absolutely correct. I wouldn't argue with them. But in my own walk with Christ, I've come to believe that these words call me to a wider application. I am bound to and linked to not just other Christians by the love of God, but to all people. And even to all creation in the love of God. More and more, I've come to believe an image that I've shared over and over. It's one of my favorite images. A rabbi asked their pupil how they could tell when the night had ended and the day was dawning. Could it be, asked one student, when you see an animal at a distance and can tell whether it's a sheep or a dog? Good answer, but that's not what I'm thinking, said the rabbi. Could it be, asked another, when you can look at a tree in the distance and tell whether it's a fig tree or a palm tree? Uh, again, a fine answer, the rabbi said, but not what I'm thinking. Well, then, what is it, said the students. It's when you look on the face of another person and see that they are your sibling. When you can do that, you know that the light is dawning. Because if you cannot do this, it will always be night. We need to be able to look beyond the world's division and realize that they're not the intention of God, these divisions. These are human creations. We can't let the world's understanding mold us, but we need to let God transform us so that we can see all around us as connected. The story of St. Valentine is an image of the life of the church in some ways. It's a story we don't often think about when we think about Valentine's Day. There are a lot of legends about St. Valentine, but they all seem to come back to one sort of central sort of story. Historians don't know much about Valentine's early life. They pick up Valentine's story after he began working as a priest. Valentine became famous for marrying couples who were in love, but couldn't get legally married in Rome during the reign of Emperor Claudius II, who outlawed weddings. Claudius wanted to recruit lots of men to be soldiers in the army and thought that marriage would be an obstacle to getting people to go into the army. And so because he needed these new soldiers, he outlawed weddings. He also wanted to prevent his existing soldiers from getting married because he thought that marriage would distract them from their work as soldiers. When Emperor Claudius discovered that Valentine was performing weddings, he sent Valentine to jail. Valentine used his time in jail to, to continue to reach out to people with the love of God that had been so much a part of his life. He befriended his jailer, Asterius, who became so impressed with Valentine's wisdom that he asked Valentine to help his daughter, Julia, with her lessons. Julia was blind. She needed someone to read material for her to learn it. Valentine became friends with Julia through his work with her when she came to visit him in the jail. Emperor Claudius also came to like Valentine. He offered to pardon Valentine and set him free if Valentine would renounce his Christian faith and agree to worship the Roman gods. Not only did Valentine refuse to leave his faith, he also encouraged Emperor Claudius to instead embrace the love of Jesus Christ. 
Valentine's faithful choice cost him his life because the Emperor Claudius was not happy with this and arranged after Valentine's response that he be sentenced to die. Before he was killed, Valentine wrote a last note to encourage Julia to stay close to Jesus and to thank her for being his friend. He signed the note, from your Valentine. That note inspired people to begin writing their own loving messages to people on Valentine's Day. On February 14th, which is celebrated on the same day on which Valentine was killed. Valentine was beaten, stoned, beheaded on February 14th. 270 people who remembered his loving service to many young couples began celebrating his life after that. And he came to be regarded as a saint through whom God had worked to help people in miraculous ways. By 496, Pope Galatius designed February 14th as Valentine's official feast day. Somehow I think that story is a vision of what Christ is offering us through the words of Paul. It's a vision that refuses to be bound by any laws or any structures or any customs. Its only rule is the rule of love that reaches out to all with new life and new hope. It's a way of existence in which one is willing to die to all safety and comfort, to be embraced by the love of God and share that love with all people. Because in Christ, we are all one. We are invited to live not by the vision of the world, but by the love of Christ. Let us pray. Lord, may your love shape us so that we live as if all people are our siblings. Amen. May we truly be united and connected in the love of God in all that we say and do. Have a wonderful week.